Hi everyone and welcome back to the channel. First of all, thanks to all of you guys who have um, given me positive comments and feedback and um, I really, really appreciate all of you guys and I'm from the bottom of my heart really thank you guys for all your support and um, I'm just grateful that I'm able to provide this information for you uh, again like I've always said this I wish I had this kind of information when I was doing my exams because it's a nice little passive learning uh, tool that is always nice to to have you know put on some headphones and just listen whenever you can't be at a desk or whatever um, so these are going to be uh, high yield topics again but in this series it's going to be for um, infectology so we're going to do something a little bit different on the channel i'm going to be dividing the infectology into different uh, videos i know all my other videos are about four or five hours um, and uh, that may be a kind of a pain in the neck uh, it's easier for me to do um, all in one shot just throw out a video there but um, it, it, it is kind of kind of an annoying sometimes so I'm gonna try to do something different I'm gonna break it up I'm gonna do virology first um, so this video is gonna be just on virology followed by another video that I'll do straight on bacteriology and then followed by um, funguses and parasitology so yeah guys um, we're gonna start off virology now and um, since we're in this pandemic of the coronavirus at the moment um, later on in the future we'll all see the differences there but um, I've been I've been ke keeping up to date with some certain things about the virus and I'd like to uh, point out some some stuff that um, I know it's a long shot of it even being on a USMLE anytime soon since it's so so new um, but I bet you that they're gonna ask you questions on this and I know that you guys have all been studying up and reading about it so this is just gonna be um, some little tidbits about about it but more geared into the uh, how the USMLE might ask you um, so we can uh, start off with uh, COVID-19 disease states first of all and uh, I'll give you like a little uh, way of how it works, how it enters the the uh, system, how it enters the, the tissue, and uh, what drugs are currently being used right now that um, seem to be uh, effective. So let's start off first of all by talking a little bit about the disease states, right? So the severity of the illness, let's put that like in the um, uh, in, into the y-axis and a time course into the x-axis right so at first the viral response phase is part of your stage one that's your early infectious stage and in this uh, stage there's going to be the clinical symptoms are going to be like mild constitutional symptoms like anything else fever higher than 99.6 degrees Fahrenheit uh, dry cough diarrhea and headache clinical signs and symptoms they can have lymphopenia or increased uh, prothrombin time, uh, increased D-dimers, and as well as a mild increase in LTH. Um, f as the uh, viral response or the stage one progresses to stage two, the viral response phase starts to uh, narrow, become smaller, and then you get into the stage two, which is your pulmonary phase, and that pulmonary phase is divided into two phases, the 2A phase and a 2B phase. And this is also the phase where you start having a host inflammatory response phase. Okay, in this section of the, in this time course, this is when patients usually present with shortness of breath, okay, and a hypoxia. So this hypoxia would be like a PaO2, FiO2 of about um, less than 300 millimeters of mercury. And clinical signs would be like abnormal CT or chest imaging. Um, they can also present with transaminitis and low normal prolactin levels. Uh, moving on from that stage 2A to 2B, um, as you go in the, further down the line in the time course, the host inflammatory response phase starts to become more and more and more, and then you end up in your stage three or your final stage, which is your hyper infl inflammation phase. And this is where, when ARDS kicks in, 
where you have SIRS or shock or even cardiac failure. There could be an elevated inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein, LDH, interleukin-6, D-dimers, ferritin, troponin, um, as well as an NT-pro-BMP elevation. Uh, so far, the potential therapies, because we really can't say which ones are, are um, definite at this point, we can just guesstimate. Um, the potential therapies as of now throughout all phases is going to be remdesivir, chloroquine, hydroxychloroquine, or even convalescent plasma transfusions. Um, and, an, and, a diff and another type of therapy is that the initial stage 1 to stage 2a phase is going to be your uh, reducing the uh, reduce immunosuppression phase. So you kind of want to reduce that immunosuppression at that stage. Uh, so all therapies are going to be geared at reducing immunosuppression. And um, the later stages, like 2b to stage 3, are going to be directed more towards giving them um, or, or yeah, giving them uh, corticosteroids, even though late, later we'll, we'll find out steroids is um, kind of controversial at this point, could be uh, worse than it is good. So corticosteroids are still uh, out there, as well as uh, immunoglobulins, IL-6 inhibitors, IL-2 inhibitors, and JAK inhibitors. Okay. Um, so... One thing um, you guys probably already know is how the virus actually gets into uh, the tissue, and that's through a receptor called an ACE2 receptor, right? And uh, the ACE2 receptor, that's going to allow the SARS-CoV-2, or also known as you know, the, the COVID-19, to enter into the cells. And the full-length form is a membrane-bound enzyme. Okay, it's shorter and it's soluble and it forms and circulates in the blood at very, very low levels. Now, ACE2 receptors thinking, okay, they're getting inside with ACE2, then ACE inhibitors, right? Well, ACE inhibitors do not actually inhibit ACE2 in itself. So ACE and ACE2 are actually entirely different enzymes. Um, also, there's ARBs, so the angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor blockers, they can actually upregulate ACE2. And the evidence is at this point is not fully consistent, and uh, information and data has di has been different per uh, arb, per organ. So it's like it, it's it's a toss up there. So actually, um, since we're talking about aces and arbs for on cardiovascular disease, then what is the burden on the cardiovascular disease risk? Uh, well, the burden of this of the the virus is that. Uh, it continues to be uh, defined, so we still don't know. No data, as of right now, like we said, suggests that ACE inhibitors or ARBs increase susceptibility or worsens a COVID-19 infection. So at this point, you don't want to discontinue ACEs or ARBs in patients with medications, with those kind of medications that are um, with hypertension, CHF, or ischemic heart disease. Um, so another thing that I wanted to say is that for the uh, all this data, by the way, I'm getting from uh, the University of Miami uh, cardiovascular website and um, their recent uh, publications, one as recent as of March 11th. Um, so the SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 cardiovascular complications would be like acute cardiac injury, and that's going to elevate troponins. Um, it's going to be higher in non-survivors, so 59% versus ICU patients, 22%. And the mechanisms is that it's a possible direct toxicity through a viral invasion into the cardiac myocyte. Um, acute coronary syndrome and demand and high demand of ischemia, as well as stress and cytokine-mediated cardiomyopathies. Then you have a myocarditis and a pericarditis, which are possible. Uh, arrhythmias are seen in 17% of hospitalized patients and in ICU patients there's about 44% uh, risk of arrhythmias. Heart failure and cardiogenic shock has been observed in about 23% of hospitalized patients and the famous cytokine storm is uh, developed when there's rapid progression of ARDS, shock, as well as multi-organ failure. All right.
Uh, so right now, how are we going to manage the treatment with COVID-19? Um, it's di it's uh, differentiated into uh, symptoms, so moderate symptoms, severe symptoms, and critical symptoms. So moderate symptoms you want to do, um, or actually mild. So let's say let's start off with mild. Mild it would just be supportive care, you know, symptomatic treatment, close uh, with close clinical monitoring. Moderate symptoms, however, as of right now, we're seeing hydroxychloroquine being a good alternative medication. Um, as well as azithromycin and also you want to pair that up with an EKG obviously and a G6PD level. Um, for severe symptoms uh, we are seeing remdesivir uh, that has been a, um, a good treatment for severe uh, symptoms. Um, alternatively you can also give hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin and at that point you can also consider uh, this other medication called tocilizumab. And for actually critically ill patients, um, that's remdesivir um, and the same treatment, remdesivir with hydroxychloroquine with or without azithromycin. And uh, again, you want to consider uh, tocilizumab, okay? Um, something uh, that's, that I found interesting in this article uh, on, on Lancet Respiratory Medic uh, Medicine, uh, from March 11th, 2020, is that it says here, human pathogenic coronaviruses, okay, like severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus, uh, they're gonna bind to the target cells through the um, ACE2 receptor. And like we said earlier, like you guys all know, and that's expressed in the epithelial cells of the lungs, the intestines, the kidney, and in the blood vessels. And now that expression of ACE2 is going to be sub, uh, substantially increased in patients that have type 1 or type 2 diabetes. So those who are treated with ACE inhibitors and um, angiotensin 2 type 1 receptor blockers or ARBs, uh, hypertension is also treated with ACE inhibitors and ARBs, and that's going to result in an upregulation of these ACE2, like we said earlier. So we can... Um, we can also find we also found out that ACE2 is also increased by um, diabetes medications like the the thio, li, I can't I can't even like pronounce that uh, thiazolinodiones and ibuprofen as well, right? So this data is going to suggest that the ACE2 expression is increased in diabetes and treatment with ACE inhibitors and ARBs actually increases ACE2 expression. Um, so that consequently means that an increased expression in ACE2 would actually facilitate the infection of the COVID-19. So the hypothesis at this point is that diabetes and hypertension, both those treatments with ACE2 stimulating drugs, can actually increase the risk of developing severe or even fatal COVID-19. But that's all a hypothesis because there's not enough su sufficient data. Um, it's not scientifically proven as of right now. It's all a hypothesis, uh, specifically that even ibuprofen can increase ACE2, uh, which um, the SARS-CoV-2 uses to bind. So um, they're actually saying that ibuprofen can actually worsen the clinical picture of uh, of the, the the viral illness, and uh, that's pretty much it. So um, in general, NSAIDs are bad for anyone who's immunocompromised. The rate of GI bleeding increases with age and comorbidity. So I mean, this this is all information we all know about NSAIDs, but uh, it increases the risk of GI bleeding. There's adverse effects on the on kidney function. There's also increased risk for cardiovascular events. And there's also increases in mortality. So there's also fewer long-term benefits that's documented in adults. Um, and there's also no immunosuppressive effects with NSAIDs. So that's, that's what um, I was able to gather. There's obviously a lot more in detail, but it's again, it's all um, hypothetical stuff at this point. Nothing is scientifically proven. And uh, I just wanted to throw that out since... Um, something along those lines are going to come out on a um on a future usmle and remember it is the coronavirus which is a rna positive sense envelope virus um so when we talk about that in virology 
uh, you'll see that signs and symptoms and the way we approach the patients are kind of almost the same s clinical situation. So um, let's keep let's keep at it. All right. Um, so the first of the viruses is going to be your herpes simplex virus, right? And the herpes simplex virus can cause something called HSV encephalitis. So viral herpes simplex virus encephalitis are going to cause fever altered mental status, confusion and agitation, and there could be a risk of seizure and a coma. And on examination, uh, people can have hemiparesis, cranial nerve palsies, and signs of focal neurological deficits like hyperreflexia. On lab and imaging, you can see on CSF an increase in white blood cells, and a, uh, those white blood cells are gonna have a lymphocytic predomination with a normal glucose count and an increase in protein. Now, brain MRI is gonna show temporal lobe abnormalities for HSV. So remember that temporal lobe abnormality. And the diagnosis is with a CSF analysis showing the presence of viral DNA on PCR. The treatment is going to be IV acyclovir, and you want to start that immediately after obtaining CSF fluid. The majority of these cases of viral encephalitis, those are going to be due to unknown causes. The herpes virus itself can cause encephalitis in immunocompetent hosts usually. And there's signs of meningeal irritation. Those are usually absent in when there's pure encephalitis. Um, empiric IV acyclovir should be started immediately after a lumbar punch, a puncture is done um, and the PCR results are still waiting. So um, you do the lumbar puncture and then you uh, start treatment with IV acyclovir. That's always a common test question. All right, so risk factors for neonatal HSV infections. Um, because of the HSV, right, is uh, primarily it's a maternal infection. It's longer duration of the rupture of membranes. So that's that can be a cause. Vaginal deliveries with active lesions and impaired skin barriers like uh, fetal scalp electrodes and preterm birth. Those are all risk factors. Now acquired the uh, HSV, um, neonatal HSV, uh, is acquired during the delivery, not in utero, remember. Um, I think they asked that. But it makes sense because you get it when, you're, when, the, when the fetus is being delivered, when the newborn is being delivered. And the newborn can deteriorate quickly due to that meningoencephalitis, which can also cause permanent hearing loss and or blindness. But heart defects, blindness, and hearing loss are not present at birth. An indication for a C-section are gonna be, uh, first of all, all women who are in labor with active genital HSV lesions. So remember, uh, active genital HSV lesion or prodromal symptoms like burning or pain. Also, pregnant women with a history of genital HSV infection, they should receive prophylactic acyclovir or valcyclovir beginning at 36 weeks of pregnancy, and that will decrease the risk of an outbreak around the time of delivery. This is gonna to lead to a decreased need in a C-section, but it's not effective if the active lesion is present at the time of the delivery. Next up, we have eczema herpeticum. Now, this is a super infection of a herpes simplex virus infection in areas where there's severe, severe eczema. So the rash, which what it's what it is, the rash can progress rapidly and it's gonna be accompanied by fever. So that's eczema herpeticum. Uh, varicella zoster is our next one. This in, uh, infection occurs in 90% of children that are less than 14 years old. The incubation period for varicella is about three weeks and most infections do occur within a two weeks of exposure. Um, pruritic vascular rash in different stages are gonna be um, what you see and that's how they're gonna describe it on the exam. Um, they're gonna be rashes in different stages, usually becoming fully crusted within a week. And the potential complications are gonna be obviously a bacterial superinfection, especially in children with pneumonia. And, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, in children and then pneumonia in adults. So if an adult has pneumonia, they can have this as a, a bacterial superinfection. 
Um, and immunocompromised patients are going to be at risk for potentially fetal disseminated disease. Now, they could be contagious two days before the rash. So that's another uh, test question. Uh, does the presence of a rash indicate um, indicate uh, that they're contagious? And no, it's actually two days before the rash onset. That's when they start becoming contagious. And all vesicles are crusted, should be isolated during this period. Now, post-exposure prophylaxis to varicella. So if they have a history of immunity before or vaccination, then you just want to observe them. But if they don't have a history of immunity or a prior infection or a prior vaccination, you want to check if they're immunocompromised or immunocompetent. If they're immunocompetent, everything's okay, you give them the varicella vaccine. However, if they're immunocompromised, you can give them uh, VZIG within 10 days of exposure. Now, the treatment of choice for an active varicella infection is going to be a cyclovir. Remember, it has to be active infection. And patients over the age of one who are non-immune, asymptomatic, and immunocompetent, they should receive the varicella vaccine for post-exposure prophylaxis. And the vaccine is 70 to 100% effective in preventing infection if given within three to five days of exposure. The vaccine is live, attenuated, and it's also contraindicated in pregnancy and if the patient is immunocompromised. Immunocompromised and neonates should receive the VZEG within 10 days of exposure, like we said earlier, and they are at an increased risk of complications. Now, the VZEG may not prevent infection, but it does decrease severity. You want to observe these patients closely because the VZIG can prolong incubation periods to more than a month. And immunity is conferred by prior infection or vaccination. These patients may be closely observed after an exposure. Next up, we're going to talk about infectious mononucleosis. In infectious mononucleosis, the etiology is that it's due to an Epstein-Barr virus infection. That's the most common. Clinical features are fever, tonsillitis, or pharyngitis, and that could be with or without exudates. There's posterior or diffuse cervical lymphadenopathy, and there can also be significant fatigue with or without hepatosplenomegaly. Now, the diagnostic findings of infectious mono is going to be a positive heterophile antibody test, which is also known as the monospot test. There's a 25% false negative rate during the first week of illness, and also atypical lymphocytosis with transient hepatitis. Um, the management for infectious mono is to basically avoid contact sports for more than three weeks due to the re increased risk of a splenic rupture. And it's also known as the kissing disease and the uh, glandular fever. So that's another way of remembering that. Um, Clinical findings are going to be a patient with jaundice or hepatitis, toxic symptoms, as well as posterior cervical lymphadenopathy that's more than anterior, inguinal, or, and axillary lymphadenopathy can also occur. And it's usually tender and mobile. Now, tonsillar enlargement can cause the air, an airway compression, but that's pretty much with all forms of tonsillitis. Um, it can compress the airway. Uh, and mild palatal petechiae can also be present, but this is going to be a nonspecific sign and can be present in strep throat and generalized maculopapular rashes. The diagnosis is going to be done with an anti-heterophile antibody test, which is the monospot test, like we said. It's sensitive and it's specific for, um, for uh, infectious mono, but it may be negative initially within the first week. If it's negative, it doesn't rule out infectious mono, so you want to repeat the test later. Um, an EBV, or Epstein-Barr virus, uh, specific antibodies may be ordered in patients with more prolonged illnesses and negative heterophile testing. Uh, it could be present at low levels for up to one year after the initial infections. Now, atypical lymphocytosis, atypical meaning that it's not typical, right? So it's not specific. And it can be seen as well as not only in an infectious mono, but it can also be seen in toxoplasmosis and rubella, roseola, 
viral hepatitis, mumps, CMV, acute HIV infections, and even some drug reactions can cause atypical lymphocytosis. Now complications of uh, infectious mono would be autoimmune hemolytic anemia and a thrombocytopenia, and that's due to the cross-reactivity of EBV-induced antibodies. Uh, against the red blood cells and the platelets. These IgM cold agglutinin antibodies, these are known as anti-L antibodies, right? And which lead to a, which lead to complement mediated destructions of the red blood cells. And that's gonna be a positive Kuhn's test usually. Uh, this complication can occur two to three weeks after the onset of the symptoms even though initial labs may not show anemia or a thrombocytopenia. Uh, splenic rupture um, and not an infarction, so it's not an infarcted spleen, it's a ruptured spleen, can occur as a result of a trauma. <clears throat> the highest risk of a trauma is going to be within three weeks of the symptom onset, so that's why you want to avoid any kind of contact sports for more than three to four weeks until the symptoms start resolving. The spleen is not palpable until it is about two to three times the normal size so it's not really a reliable method to check whether a person can return back to uh, sports or not so uh, feeling your spleen is that's just something that it'd be cool if you can feel it but it really doesn't tell you much uh, so don't rely on that to let you to tell the patient they can go back to playing contact sports uh, Ultrasound can be used to consider the return to strenuous sports um, that can cause increased intra-abdominal pressures. Next up is going to be uh, CMV or cytomegalovirus. Congenital CMV and rubella are both going to share the similar presentation, so they're both going to come and present with deafness, purpura, hepatosplenomegaly, as well as jaundice, but the difference in between the two is that uh, deafness is unilateral in CMV. So in, in, in CMV, it's unilateral. In rubella, it's bilateral. <coughs> and blindness, the blindness is due to chorioretinitis, and the heart is going to be unaffected in uh, CMV. So um, that's, that's the CMV connection. Next, parvovirus B19. Clinical features of parvovirus B19 uh, are going to be up to 75% of patients, they're going to present asymptomatically, so no symptoms. They're not going to have any kind of flu-like symptoms, so the majority are going to be asymptomatic. Um, they can also present with erythema infectiosum, which is fifth disease. It's more common in children with fever, nausea, and a malar rash on the cheeks. Um, signs and symptoms for parvo can also be acute symmetrical arthralgias and arthritis that are usually in the hands and the wrists, the knees and the feet. So that does resemble rheumatoid arthritis. And they can also have a transient aplastic anemia in patients with a history of hematological diseases like sickle cell disease. Now the diagnosis for parvo is um, if it's an acute infection, uh, the parvovirus B19 IgM antibodies and immunocompetent individuals. Remember IgM is going to be the one to uh, look for in acute disease. And the uh, nucleic acid amplification test is done in immunocompromised patients. Um, also previous infections by uh, parvo B19 IgG antibodies documents immunity. Remember IgG is more of a chronic thing like uh, previous and previous history of it, and um, reactivation of a previous infection by nucleic acid amplification testing is done to detect parvovirus B19 DNA. So nearly 75% of adults, like we said, they develop the nonspecific rash. So remember that 75% are pretty much asymptomatic, but less than 20% do develop characteristics erythema infectiosum rash. Parvovirus does not cause joint destruction or chronic arthritis. The IgM antibody is going to be quick. It develops within 10 to 15 days after the infection, and it can usually remain positive for up to six months. Symptoms are going to resolve spontaneously within two to three weeks without the need of any kind of specific treatment. And morning stiffness is going to last less than an hour 
So that's the difference between rheumatoid arthritis because it does resemble rheumatoid arthritis because of the pain in the joints, right? But uh, their morning stiffness is going to last less than an hour, unlike rheumatoid arthritis, which lasts more. Uh, no joint swelling or redness is going to be present in parvovirus. And for rheumatoid arthritis, symptoms should be present for more than six weeks. All right. Next one is an odd one. And it's also part of the uh, <laughs> RNA viruses, um, positive sense uh, enveloped RNA viruses. And this is the chikungunya fever. I always I don't know how to pronounce that chikungunya fever whatever so epidemiology it's uh, it's going to be in Central and South America in tropical regions of Africa South Asia I mean just by the name you can think it's kind of jungly right so just think of those areas in South America tropical Africa South Asia and the vector in this chikungunya fever is going to be the 80s mosquito it's the same mosquito that we see dengue fever and the clinical manifestations is going to have an incubation period of about three to seven days um, there's going to be high fevers with severe polyarthralgias and that's going to be almost always present the polyarthralgias they can also have headache myalgias conjunctivitis macular papular rash uh, lymphadenopathy uh, lymphopenia, thrombocytopenia, as well as elevated liver enzymes. And the management is going to be supportive care. It usually resolves within 7 to 10 days. <clears throat> now remember that chikungunya fever is a mosquito-borne viral illness with recent outbreaks in the Americas and in the Caribbean islands. The diagnosis is going to be serological testing, which confirms the diagnosis. And rarely patients develop persistent arthritis. With disseminated gonococcemia, it's going to present with tenosynovitis, polyarthralgia, dermatitis, and a pustular or vesicular pustular lesion. But usually it's not associated with macular lesions or lymphadenopathy. All right, next up is going to be rubella, or your German measles, right? So rubella, German measles. Clinically, how is rubella going to present? It's going to present congenitally with sensorineural hearing loss, intellectual disability, and cardiac abnormalities as well as cataracts or glaucoma. Now in children, children can present with low-grade fever, they can have conjunctivitis, and that's a non-exudative conjunctivitis by the way. They can have coryza or coriza, cervical lymphadenopathy, and Forshemeyer spots. I don't know what that is. But uh, another one is cephalocaudal spread of blanching erythematous macular papular rash. And in adolescents or adults, um, they're going to present pretty much the same as you see in children with low-grade fever, conjunctivitis, cervical lymphadenopathy, whatever. And um, they're also going to present with arthralgias and arthritis. So add that to it, and uh, we're looking at rubella. So the diagnosis is going to be done with a PCR, a polymerase chain reaction, and an acute and convalescent serology for anti-rubella IgM and IgG. Prevention is going to be with the live attenuated rubella vaccine, and the treatment is supportive care. It can be asymptomatic in 25 to 50% of adults, and it's con it could be contagious up to three weeks during the incubation period, before the onset of symptoms. So most of these are gonna be contagious before they even present with symptoms. Something to be aware of. They do like to ask a question or two like that, just to trip you up. Children's may, children may remain asymptomatic or develop mild disease two to three weeks after inhalation of infected respiratory droplets. Uh, the prodrome is going to be fever, tender lymphadenopathy, as well as malaise, which can occur with a rash. There's, there can also be a maculopapular erythematous rash that spreads in a cranial caudal pattern and in a centrifugal direction within 24 hours, which spares the palms and the soles. And it can last less than three days. The resolution for this is that most symptoms are going to go away and resolve within a few days, but there can be joint problems that can last up to several months. 
Complications are going to be uh, post-infectious encephalitis, which is a rare complication that can occur within a week of, ex of exanthema. And in pregnant women who develop infection in the first trimester, those are going to be an increased risk of miscarriage. Remember, the first trimester is the most, probably the most important of the th trimesters uh, because everything is developing super quickly. So if any problems within the first trimester, that's when you have an increased risk of miscarriage or severe birth defects that's most devastating during that period. This can be prevented by selective immunization of females of reproductive age, but widespread immunization is going to be preferable for its eradication. Uh, next up is going to be measles. So measles has a rash that's similar to rubella, but it's more gradual spread and it does appear darker or reddish brown color. And the fever can also be a high grade fever. So you're looking at a fever about 104 or 40 degrees Celsius as compared to rubella. In measles, which is uh, rubiola, the clinical presentation is that they're gonna have a prodrome of fever, malaise, and anorexia, as well as coryza, cough, conjunctivitis, and the coplic spots. That's, those are the best ones, uh, my favorite ones to look out for, so obviously don't expect it to be on the exam. Uh, so, but I think they're gonna have to do something like that. I mean, how else? So erythem. Uh, you'll have blanching reddish brown macular papular rash. Remember that reddish brown rash? And um, it's going to be in a cephalocaudal and centrifugal spread. Now, they'd love how these viruses spread in um, describing them in the vignettes. So remember how they spread. That's a big pointer. So for measles or rubiola, it spreads cephalocaudal and centrifugal spread. And it usually spares the palms and the soles. The diagnosis is going to be a PCR test, a polymerase chain reaction, and acute and convalescent serologies, again, for anti-measles, IgM, and IgG. For prevention, the live attenuated measles vaccine is good, and the treatment is going to be supportive care with vitamin A for hospitalized children. Uh, complications would be like otitis media, pneumonia, and um, neurological complications like encephalitis within within days can occur also acute disseminated and uh, encephalomyelitis within weeks and within years you can even get uh, sclerosing panencephalitis so subacute sclerosing panence panencephalitis within years um, anything that's sclerosing is going to take a really long time so that's a good way to remember that and finally uh gastroenteritis. So again, the incubation period is going to be one to three weeks after the inhalation of respiratory droplets, which remain airborne for several hours. Um, the disease spread is most contagious during cough and coryza, but it can spread um, distantly up to five days. Uh, they can spread the disease five days before the rash and four days after the rash resolves. Preventive measures are going to be that the patients with known or suspected disease should enter healthcare facilities through a dedicated isolation entrance, and they should be placed immediately in a private room with negative air pressure and a minimum of 6 to 12 air changes per hour with the doors closed. And all persons in the room have to wear an N95 face mask with tight seals over their nose and their mouth. Sounds familiar, right? Interesting. All right. So next, key respiratory tract infections in children. So um, here we're going to talk about laryngoencephalitis or croup, epiglottitis, and bronchiolitis. So basically, laryngotracheitis or your croup, that's going to be caused by the parainfluenza virus. And the presentation here is um, a child within six, that's aged six months to three years old. And croup is going to be a barky, coughing strider and a hoarse voice. Um, so just think of a dog barking the word croup. So croup, croup. That's a barking, coughing strider or hoarse voice. Laryngotracheitis, parainfluenza. Next is epiglottitis which is 
uh, caused by the H influenza virus, and um, it presents in unvaccinated children. Uh, sore throats can occur, dysphagia, drooling, and their tripod positioning. And then finally, bronchiolitis is going to be caused by the RSV virus, the respiratory syncytial virus, and the age is going to be less than two years old with wheezing and coughing. Croup, or laryngotracheobronchitis, um, its pathogenesis, like we said earlier, we're going to break these down because uh, remember, I'll say like the, the, couple, the little group of uh, diseases quickly and then we'll break it down. So now we're breaking down croup. Uh, the pathogenesis here is the parainfluenza viral infection, which is inflammation of the larynx and the trachea. And the epidemiology is going to be at age six months to three years, and it occurs in the fall or early winter. Clinical features are going to have an inspiratory strider, a barky seal-like cough, and a hoarse voice. And the treatment um, for mild symptoms, meaning that they don't have strider, is to give them steroids. But if they do have moderate or severe symptoms, meaning they have strider at rest, then you can give steroids as well as nebulized epinephrine. And the strider worsens with agitation or excitement and may be inspiratory or biphasic, meaning that it's an inspiratory and expiratory in very severe cases. Uh, the diagnosis is typically going to be clinical, and if it's unclear, you got to check an AP uh, x-ray of the neck, uh, which is going to show subglottic edema, and known as the steeple sign. And the treatment here is going to be steroids, which decrease airway edema, as well as nebulized epinephrine that constricts the mucosal arterioles in upper airway and, the, and then alters the capillary hydrostatic pressures, which decrease airway edema and also decreases secretions. For endotracheal intubation, um, this uh, intubation is going to be obviously reserved for those who failed any of the two mentioned above um, uh, complication uh, treatments like steroids or nebulized ep epinephrine and they're still doing bad. That's when you do the endotracheal intub intubation or if they have signs of impending respiratory failure like they're starting to have altered mental status or a poor respiratory effort. So that was croup. Next up is rabies. So human rabies. Now the pathogenesis here is that the transmission of the rabies virus is from a bite of an infective, infected mammal. And the reservoir in the United States is going to be the bats, which is most commonly. Um, also raccoons can be a reservoir, um, skunks and foxes. And in developing worlds, it's going to be the dog. Now, clinical features of rabies is they can have encephalitic features or paralytic features. Encephalitic features are going to be hydrophobia, aerophobia. They can have a pharyngeal spasm or spastic paralysis as well as agitation. And paralytic features can be like ascending flaccid paralysis. Post-exposure prophylaxis um, is going to be a rabies immunoglobulin and rabies vaccine immediately after exposure to high-risk wild animals. And the prognosis for the rabies is uh, they, can, they can even get a coma. They can have respiratory failure and death within weeks. So rabies is nothing to joke about. It's critical. The incubation period is about one to three months. Remember that bat bites are small and relatively painless. So they're going to go on notice and mostly occur during the night. So remember, think about the clinical scenario of somebody that goes camping and, you know, later they start having symptoms a couple of days later and then they see that they have bite marks because they're painless. Therefore, all patients with direct exposure to bats require rabies prophylaxis unless they were aware of uh, the bat at all times and are certain that they were not bitten or scratched, which is pretty much never the case, right? All right, so post-exposure prophylaxis for rabies. Let's start it off the algorithm here. An animal bite with the possible rabies exposure. Um, it could be either a high-risk wild animal like a bat, raccoon, a skunk, a fox, or a coyote. You're going to want to start... Um, uh, prophylactic treatment if unable to test the animal and if they're able to test the animal you want to start on 
uh, prophylactic treatment uh, of rabies if the rabies test is positive. Um, if there's a low risk wild animal, like if it's a squirrel or a chipmunk or a mouse or a rabbit, you don't need to do post exposure prophylaxis. Um, if it's a dog or a cat or a ferret that bites you, and you got to find out if they're available for quarantining. If they are, you want to observe the animal for 10 days, and there's no need for post exposure prophylaxis if the animal looks healthy. However, if the animal is not available for quarantining, uh, you want to test animal if possible and you want to start post-exposure prophylaxis and discontinue if the rabies test is, ne is negative. Um, for livestock or any kind of unknown wild animal, you want to contact the public health department because at that point it's like who knows. So first, patients bitten by a high-risk wild animal even if the animal is available for testing, you want to start post-exposure prophylaxis and test the animal. If negative, you want to stop the post-exposure prophylaxis. For cats and dogs that can cause rabies in the U.S. are more are mostly the ones which arrive from other countries. So um, the first step in the process of rabies prevention, again, is cleaning the wound to reduce the risk by 90%. If the patient is not vaccinated, then both passive IgG and active rabies vaccine immunization is needed. If the patient is previously vaccinated with documented neutralizing antibodies responses in the past, then you only need to revaccinate the patient. And if the patient and animal are both not vaccinated, but the animal does appear healthy, then the patient can wait for 10 days for the animal to be observed. And if the animal becomes sick, you wanna start post exposure prophylaxis immediately. If the animal does become sick during that time, then you want to euthanize the animal and test the brain for fluorescent antibodies for the rabies. All right, moving along, we're going to be speaking about hepatitis A. So hepatitis A has an incubation period of about 30 days, and its mortality rate is less than 0.2%, but it does have an increase in mortality if uh, there's a significantly prolonged PT interval. Um, the treatment is going to mainly be supportive treatment and complete recovery usually um, is seen within three to six weeks. Close contact should promptly be given immunoglobulin and high risk patients like people living or traveling to endemic areas or those patients that have chronic liver disease or clotting factor di disorders or people who are men who have sex with men should be given vaccination prophylactically. <clears throat> Next, we're going to talk about hepatitis B. So when you look at hepatitis B, uh, try to look at the, um, the graphs where it shows the anti-hepatitis B core, enveloped antigen, surface antigen, its phases and um, like symptoms, where you're going to be seeing it. Uh, try to memorize those graphs because they do highly, highly test that. So healthcare workers with previous hepatitis B vaccinations and known antibody responses don't need post-exposure uh, prophylaxis. However, some physicians do recommend that they should be receiving one hepatitis B booster if they have been exposed to an infected person. <clears throat> now, patients with no previous vaccination history or inadequate antibody responses should receive hepatitis B vaccines as soon as possible if they are exposed to blood or infected patients. <clears throat> the first dose of the vaccine is recommended within the first 12 hours with the next two doses according to standard schedule. Unvaccinated hepatitis C, um, or I'm sorry, unvaccinated healthcare workers uh, exposed to hepatitis B positive people should also receive hepatitis B immunoglobulin as soon as possible, preferably within 24 hours. The window period is going to be the time lag between the disappearance of hepatitis B surface antigen and the appearance of an anti-hepatitis B surface <coughs> antigen. Hepatitis B uh, surface appears four to eight weeks after the infection. Um, the IgM anti-hepatitis B core is going to develop around that same time when the symptoms develop and their aminotransferases are going to rise to more than 25 times the normal. These two markers are going to be those the most useful for the diagnosis of an acute infection.
So as an overview of hepatitis B virus treatment, so the patients that you want to treat are going to be patients that have an acute liver failure, clinical complications of cirrhosis, you know, like liver disease patients, advanced cirrhosis with high serum HBV DNA, as well as patients without cirrhosis, but they do have a positive hepatitis B enveloped antigen, hepatitis B virus DNA that's more than 20,000 um, units and serum ALTs that are two times the upper limit of normal. Also, uh, you want to prevent hepatitis B virus reactivation dur uh, during chemotherapy or immunosuppression because those can reactivate the virus that's latent. Available treatments are going to be like interferon, which is usually for younger patients um, with compensated liver disease for short-term treatment. There's also the mivudine, which is, diminishes the role um, due to a higher drug resistance. So they really don't use that often. It may have a role, however, in HIV patients, but it's no longer the case for hepatitis, <coughs> the mivudine. Um, then you have entecavir, which can be used in decompensated cirrhosis with a lower rate of drug resistance than the mivudine. And you also have a one called tenofovir, which is the most potent uh, with limited drug resistance. It's the preferred drug for hepatitis B in countries that have approved it. Um, there's, an also, there's also another one for the treatment for hepatitis v, uh, C, which is a pegylated, peg, pegylated interferon with ribavirin used for the treatment of hepatitis C and telaprevir, which is added to that combination for patients that have a um, genotype of one hepatitis B, hepatitis C infection. <clears throat> Next, we're going to talk about hepatitis B and fulminant hepatic failure. So more than 90% of adults with hepatitis B recover completely. Uh, there's going to be a minority which develop chronic hepatitis B and 0.1 to 0.5% are going to progress to fulminant hepatic failure. So fulminant hepatic failure is going to basically be hepatic encephalopathy that develops within eight weeks of an onset of an acute liver failure. The risk factors for fulminant hepatic uh, failure is going to be for heavy users of acetaminophen, so like a uh, Tylenol over overdose, alcoholics, methamphetamine uses, and in those patients who are co-infected with hepatitis B and with hepatitis D viruses. Fulminant hepat uh, hepatic failure has a high mortality rate, so more than 80% are gonna are gonna die. Patients with this condition are considered high priority candidates for liver transplant if there's a suitable donor available. Also, um, orthotopic liver transplant or like an original liver is removed and a new liver is going to be transplanted in the same place is going to be the, about the only effective med mode of treatment of a fulminant hepatic failure. And it has to be considered in all patients that present this way. So regardless of the etiology, these patients are going to have a high risk of dying within a few days of the symptom onset, unfortunately. And the general contraindications for liver transplant are going to be if the patient already has an irreversible cardiopulmonary disease that's causing um, prohibitive risk, uh, an incurable or recent malignancy that they'll have like less than five years to live um, external to a liver problem and active alcoholics or drug abuse. So any patient who is pretty much going to be dying for other reasons or that just really aren't going to take care of their liver anytime soon because they're active alcoholics or drug abusers, then that is a contraindication for liver transplant. Next up, we're going to talk about hepatitis C. And hepatitis C is the most Com the most common mode of transportation is going to be by exposure of contaminated blood products. So that's why we get all nervous when we get pricked in the hospital or in a healthcare profession that uh, you get pricked by a needle or something. So hepatitis C clinical features are going to be um, chronically, they can be asymptomatic or they can de develop fatigue, which is the most common cause the most common um, presentation is fatigue. Other nonspecific symptoms like nausea, anorexia, myalgia, there can be arthralgia, weakness, and weight loss, 
serum transaminases can be elevated or normal. Uh, up to one third of the patients um, can have uh, elevated serum transaminases. And they can also progress to cirrhosis. 20 per, up to 20% of patients can progress to a cirrhosis. There's an increased risk of hepatocellular carcinoma as well. <clears throat> Extra hepatic manifestations. Um, so in the blood, you're gonna have a mixed, essential mixed cryoglobulinemia um, can manifest. In the kidneys, um, there could be a, me a membranoproliferative glomerulonephritis. On the skin, you can have a porphyria cutanea tarda or a lynch and planus, as well as palpable purpura or a leukocytoclastic vac vasculitis. And uh, endocrinology, um, you can have an increased risk of diabetes. Those are all extra hepatic manifestations of chronic hepatitis B C. Now, the porphyria cutanea tarda, remember that's a fragile skin with photosensitivity and the vessels and erosions happen on the dorsum of the hands, basically the area, the, the part of the hand that's exposed to the sun more is going to have those erosions and vesicles start popping up. Um, all patients with uh, porphyria cutanea tarda should be screened for hepatitis C virus because there's a real strong correlation with that. So just think of a vampire has an increased risk for, hepat for hepatitis C virus, right? Um, because that's what porphyria cutanea tarda looks like. Somebody who has um, photosensitivity to the sunlight, right? So anyway, uh, ex essential mixed cryoglobulin cryoglobulinemia. Now 90% of patients of essential mixed cryoglobulinemia have hepatitis C virus and 50% of those patients with hepatitis C virus have essential mixed cryoglobulinemia and that's due to circulating immune complexes that deposit in the small and medium blood vessels and that leads to low complement levels because they're all being used up. Screening patients who have received clotting factors before 1987 or blood transfusions before 1992, that's before they were screening for hepatitis C, have needle stick exposures or workplace or injection drug use, elevated ALTs, HIV positivity, chronic hemodialysis, or if you were born in the United States between 1945 and 1965, are all at increased risk for hepatitis C virus and should be screened for hepatitis C virus at some point. So uh, sexual contacts of patients with hepatitis C virus should also be screened and screening is also recommended if obviously you get pricked by a needle to uh, hepatitis C viral positive blood for or for children that are born to a patient that has hepatitis C virus. <clears throat> All right moving on we're going to talk about acute HIV infection. So epidemiology is typically HIV is um, presents at two to four weeks after the exposure. That's really important to, to know because they love to ask a question where a patient had a crazy um, night, he had a lot of unprotected sex, and he feels bad and guilty about it, and he goes and gets himself an HIV uh, test, and the test comes back negative, and he's all happy. Well, guess what? You know, uh, typically HIV doesn't present about until about two to four weeks after the exposure. So what he just got was a false negative result. Clinical features are going to be a mononucleosis-like symptom, so fever, lymphadenopathies, sore throat, arthralgias, and generalized macular rash. Also, GI symptoms are seen as well. And the diagnosis for an acute HIV infection is that the viral load is going to be markedly elevated, specifically more than 100,000 copies. The diagnosis also with HIV antibody testing can be negative um, if it's not yet uh, seroconverted, as well as CD4 count may be normal. And the management of acute HIV infection is going to be with combined enterovirotroviral therapy, uh, you're going to notify the partner and you want to also consider secondary prophylaxis. So how then do you screen for HIV? The initial screening, if the patient's between the age of 15 to 65, 
um, the treatment uh, also for tr if they're treating tuberculosis or if they're in the treatment for another type of STD uh, those are the ones that you'd want to screen first uh, annually uh, in IV drug users um, and their sexual partners men who have sex with men um, prostitutes like sex for money or drugs partner that is HIV positive a patient or a partner that has had more than one partner since his last HIV test uh, a homeless shelter living condition or a correctional facility incarnate incarceration these are all require annual screening indications and then additional screening is if the patient is pregnant it's recommended to have an HIV test done um, occupational exposure to bloody or body fluids any new type of STD symptom and it's suggested that prior to any new sexual relationship you should get screened for it now the preferred HIV screening is a fourth generation assay that detects both HIV P24 antigen and the HIV antibody that combination can be more effectively done to diagnose both acute or early infection compared to just the antibody test alone patients that have a positive test should then undergo confirmatory testing with HIV-1 and HIV-2 antibody differentiation immunoassays as well as plasma HIV RNA testing is recommended for those that have a negative serological test and high clinical suspicion of an acute HIV <clears throat> now if in pregnancy how do you screen for HIV is that all pregnant women should undergo universal HIV antibody screening in the first trimester high risk patients should then be retested during the third trimester or at delivery because it can take up to three months for antibodies to become detectable and that's also known as the window period which leads to a high level of HIV that's present but the antibody screen is going to be falsely negative the way you screen an infancy is that the HIV antibody screening is actually unreliable in infancy PCR is then going to be the gold standard from the time the infant is born to about 18 months of age and infected newborns are then generally asymptomatic and gradually start developing symptoms then you want to immediately start them on heart therapy as soon as possible to diagnose um, uh, as the diagnosis is then confirmed because half of untreated patients will end up progressing to AIDS within the first year unfortunately now prenatal intrapartum and postnatal management of HIV patient um, is in the prenatal period you want to test the HIV one viral load every month until it's undetectable then you want to change you want to check every three months you also want to check the cd4 cell count every three months and the resistance testing if not previously obtained um, remember you want to in initiate the three drug heart regimen the heart regimen the highly act and highly active antiretroviral three treatment is most important uh, measure and in intervention for preventing the spread from the mother to the fetus NRTIs with good placental transfers like zidovudine or tenofovir those should be uh, used in these cases so um, you can do a three drug heart so either two NRTIs with an NNRTI or two NRTIs with a protease inhibitor is a good um, drug regimen now, uh, prophylaxis against opportunistic infections of the CD4 cell count is less than 200. And you also want to avoid amniocentesis until the viral load is undetectable because you can pass it along uh, with that needle. Intrapartum, a rapid HIV test if not previously performed. You also want to avoid artificial rupture of membranes, fetal scalp electrodes, and instrumentations like vacuums or forceps. And if the mother is not on heart medications like zidovudine, or if the viral load is more than a thousand copies, then zidovudine is given, and you want to perform a C-section. And then finally, um, postnatal management of HIV infection. If it's uh, for the mother, it's you want to continue 
the heart regimen and if it's an infant you want to give them zidovudine for more than six weeks plus serial HIV PCR testing. Um, remember that antiretroviral therapy that should be administered as soon as possible even if it's the first trimester regardless of the maternal CD4 count and the viral load. Uh, mothers with undetectable viral loads at delivery have less than 1% risk of transmitting that infection to the infants, and mothers who do not receive antinatal or antiretroviral therapy, the addition of nevirapine therapy to that infant's regimen can also reduce the risk of maternal to child HIV transmission. So what are some of the opportunistic infections in HIV? So um, we have pneumocystis gyrovechi, toxoplasma, we have um, mycobacterium, and we have um, another histoplasma capsulatum. So for pneumocystis gyrovechi, risk factors here would be a CD4 count that's less than 200, and they're gonna present with oral pharyngeal, or risk factors or would be oral pharyngeal candida. And how would you prophylax against pneumocystis gyrovechi? That would be with TMP SMX, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. For toxoplasma gondii, the CD4 count um, will be uh, less than 100 for risk factors. And they'll also have a positive toxoplasma IgG antibodies. Those are risk factors for opportunistic toxoplasmosis infection in HIV. Again, you want to prophylax this with TMP SMX. Um, if the CD4 count is less than 50, we start worrying about Mycobacterium avium complex or Mycobacterium uh, intracellulare. Uh, here, we want to prophylax with azithromycin. And finally, if the uh, CD4 count is less than 150, and if the uh, person is endemic to an area like Ohio or the Mississippi River Valley, then you're thinking of histoplasma capsulatum and with this, you want to prophylax with itraconazole. Now, the optimal approach to preventing opportunistic infections with HIV or AIDS patients are going to include antiretroviral therapy, which maintains a high CD4 count, and it prevents um, opportunistic infections as well. The advent, the advan, uh, sorry, the adjunctive therapies include vaccination, um, specifically vaccination uh, with the uh, pneumococcal vaccine for example, and antibiotic prophylaxis. Antibiotic prophylaxis is, is gonna include um, a primary prophylaxis, which is before the infection happens, and then a secondary prophylaxis is given once the infection has occurred, and then that medicine is given to prevent a reoccurrence. So primary prophylaxis is given as uh, we said earlier, right? So for pneumocystis, we give TMP. For toxoplasmosis, we give TMP. With uh, Mycobacterium avium, we give azithromycin, and for histoplasma, we give itraconazole. Um, for acyclovir and valacyclovir, these can be given to prevent um, HSV recurrences, but it's used for patients with frequent or severe recurrences, regardless of their CD4 count. So that's um, something good to remember. Acyclovir, valcyclovir. Every whenever you see that, you should automatically be um, jumping to HSV anyway. Next, odinophagia and dysphagia in patients with HIV. So how would you approach odinophagia and dysphagia in patients with HIV? So there's a little uh, algorithm over here. So um, if you're suspecting patients with that have esophagitis, meaning they have dysphagia or odinophagia, then you gotta check their symptoms. Do they have thrush or do they not have thrush? If they have mild symptoms with thrush, then most likely that esophagitis is likely candida. So you want to give empiric treatment with fluconazole. Um, and you can also do an endoscopy if there's no improvement with the treatment. Uh, however, if the patient does have severe symptoms, but they don't have thrush, then you want to go straight into doing an endoscopy because likely they have like a viral um, cause of it, so like herpes simplex virus or a CMV virus, right? So if that's the case, on endoscopy you can see either white plaques, you can see linear large ulcers, you can see vesicles, or you can see an aphthous ulcer. So if you see white plaques, most likely that's going to be candida, so 
white plaques, candida, you want to treat with fluconazole. However, if you see large linear ulcers, you're going to think CMV most likely. And if that's the case, what do we treat CMV? Is with gancyclovir. Um, if you see vesicles and round or ovoid ulcers, then that's a herpes simplex virus that's likely. You want to treat that with a cyclovir, like we said. And um, if you see an aphthous ulcer, then just give them symptomatic therapy only. Um, however, what if we have, um, so that was for dysphagia or adenophagia, but what if you have esophagitis and HIV? So remember, um, the common causes of esophagitis are going to be like candida, which is going to produce the white plaques with the oral thrush, treat with fluconazole. Um, herpes simplex virus is going to have that herpetic vesicles that are round or ovoid shaped ulcers. And um, CMV is going to have that deep linear ulcer, um, specifically distal in the distal esophagus, but it can be anywhere really. And in idiopathic aphthous ulcers, um, they're just concurrent oral ulcers so you treat symptomatically. So the most common cause of esophagitis in, H in HIV is going to be candida, more than 60% of patients. So patients with oral thrush are going to be treated with oral fluconazole for three to five days. Now, if they don't respond to that or they don't have any thrush, then the next step, remember what we said was you want to do an esophagoscopy with culture, biopsy, and cytology. However, in patients that have severe adenophagia, like they have pain on swallowing, uh, without dysphagia, with the, which is difficulty swallowing, they just have pain and they have oral thrush, then viral esophagitis is going to be the one that's most likely uh, more than candida. So um, that can be either mild to moderate adenophagia, which can be uh, present in candida, but um, what they're trying to get to here is that if you have pain on swallowing with no dysphagia, then it's most likely a viral etiology. But pain on swallowing with dysphagia, think uh, candida. All right, so the diagnosis is going to be obviously done by looking at it with a GI endoscopy and biopsy, and you want to confirm it uh, on the basis of histopathology and culture. All right, next up is diarrhea in AIDS patients. So what are the most common causes of diarrhea in patients with AIDS? So we have, um, well, it depends on the uh, CD4 count, right? So if it's less than 180, then we're thinking cryptosporidium. And how does that present? That presents with a severe watery diarrhea, a low-grade fever and weight loss. These are all very high-yield presentations. Uh, that they're going to show you on, they're going to describe you on the vignettes. So patient comes in, low-grade fever, weight loss, but bing, ding, ding, severe watery diarrhea, CA4 count is less than 180, think cryptosporidium. Now, they can. this is another uh, situation where you have watery diarrhea, so I don't think watery diarrhea is like the biggest clue. Um, just look for the CD4 count, that's most important. So this patient has watery diarrhea as well, with crampy abdominal pain, weight loss, um, with or without fever, but the CD4 count now is less than 100, now you're thinking microsporidium, isosporidium. Um, same situation, weight loss, watery diarrhea, but they in here we have a high fever, more than 102.2 or more than 39 Celsius, with a CD4 count less than 50. What are we looking at over here? That's mycobacterium avium complex, or MAC. And then finally, uh, another CD4 count less than 50 with frequent small volume diarrhea, uh, but they also can present with hematochezia and abdominal pain, low-grade fever and weight loss. CD4 count, again, less than 50. This is CMV. All right, so again, CD4 counts less than 180 is cryptosporidium. Less than 100 is, you're thinking, microsporidium. Less than 50 is going to be either mycobacterium avium or CMV. So how do you differentiate um, CMV from mycobacterium? Um, I guess with a fever, right? So the MAC is going to have a high fever. CMV is going to have a low-grade fever. All right, and they're all going to present with some kind of watery diarrhea, some more severe watery diarrhea, like cryptosporidium, than others. So if they, they mention watery diarrhea, 
take it with a grain of salt, look more specifically at that CD4 count. All right, I think I harped enough on that. Next, uh, common antiretroviral side effects. We have your protease inhibitors. Um, Protease inhibitors are crystal induced uh, are seen with crystal induced nephropathy because of a prescription. I'm sorry, not prescription because of the precipitation of the drug in the urine, and that's going to cause an obstruction of the urine flow. Uh, according to one study, eight percent of patients had urinary symptoms, and twenty percent had urinary crystals that were composed of indinavir. So those crystals were actually composed of an antiviral. Although adequate hydration can reduce the risk of nephrotoxicity, uh, but it has been seen in well hydrated patients as well. This complication can develop early on or later on in the disease course, and for those reasons, some clinicians are going to recommend periodic monitoring with urine analysis and as your serum creatinine levels every three to four months. So when, if you're on those kind of uh, protease inhibitors, um, you're going to need to monitor your your, anal uh, your creatine levels every three to four months. Um, some of the things that these cause, like didanosine, is going to cause an induced pancreatitis. That's a very common question. Abacavir is going to be related to a hypersensitivity syndrome. Um, any uh, use with NRTIs are going to cause secondary lactic acidosis. Uh, and then RTIs are going to give you, uh, not going to give you, but you have a higher risk of Steven Johnson syndromes. And then finally, uh, nevirapine is going to be associated with liver failure. So try to um, remember the common antiretroviral side effects. The danosine with pancreatitis is a big one. A bacavir hypersensitivity reaction, lactic acidosis with NRTIs is a big one. Um, uh, Steven Johnson syndrome, not asked very frequently, but you can remember that with NNRTIs and nevirapine, never give with liver failure because it's associated with liver failure. All right, uh, vaccinations is our next topic. So we're going to be um, subdividing it into either live attenuated vaccines or non live or, you know, dead vaccines, right? Um, so the live attenuated vaccines are going to be, I don't know, just try to remember your um, mnemonics from step one for this, but basically it was oral polio, uh, measles, mumps, and rubella, the MMR is live attenuated, rotavirus, influenza, intranasal influenza, okay, because intramuscular is, is not live. Uh, so intranasal influ influenza is a live attenuated vaccine, yellow fever, and um, varicella zoster is also, these are all live attenuated vaccines. The ones that are not are going to be intramuscular influenza, uh, the pneumococcal vaccine, the um, uh, DPT or diphtheria, pertussis, and tetanus, uh, toxoid, or I'm sorry, not toxoid, typhoid vaccine, hepatitis A and B, and actually haemophilus influenza type B. Uh, also, the human papillomavirus, meningococcal virus, and the inactivated polio, that's kind of a given. If it says inactivated, that means it's not live, is um, also a not, is non, non-live virus. So, um, the administration of multiple vaccinations in a single office visit is going to be safe and in and increases vaccine compliance and optimal pr protection when the patient is at a young age. The exception is going to be with the live virus vaccines, which should be administered four weeks apart, and that's due to the possible interference of the immune response, right? So whenever you're giving these vaccines, it's going to kind of mess around with your immune system. So uh, if a live vaccine is in the mix, you kind of want to wait four weeks before giving a live vaccine. Uh, just because they may be susceptible uh, because their immune system may be um, on the fritz. So uh, live virus vaccinations can be safely administered to household contacts uh, of pregnant women, not pregnant women, household contacts of pregnant women because the virus is weak 
and it's not very contagious. Now vaccinations can be safely administered in mild infections. However, it should be postponed in moderate to severe um, infections until recovery. All right, so what are some of the recommended vaccines for pediatric patients? So for, um, so the pediatric immunizations are gonna be like the killed ones or inactivated ones. These are gonna be the inactive polio. There's also hepatitis A uh, virus. Uh, those are the immunizations, hepatitis A immunization and polio. That's the inactivated killed. The toxoid one that's also inactivated, but it's a toxoid is gonna be the diphtheria and the tetanus. The subunit or conjugate vaccines are gonna be hepatitis B, pertussis, Haemophilus influenza type B for um, also uh, pneumococcal vaccine, uh, the pneumococcal vaccine, meningococcal, HPV, and influenza injections. So the injection type is gonna be the uh, subunit or conjugate vaccines. And then finally, the live attenuated ones, like we said, are the rotavirus, measles, mumps, rubella, varicella, and intranasal influenza vaccines. So premature infants, especially high risk uh, of dangerous complications from vaccine preventable diseases. Uh, vaccinations for medically stable preterm in infants should be administered by chronological age and not gestational age. Um, remember the vaccination is safe and antib uh, antibody response is going to be adequate to confer immunity. Um, therefore, all stable preterm uh, infants should receive the first dose of the hepatitis B vaccine at birth, unless the infant is going to be weighing less than four pounds, six ounces, um, then you don't. So the first dose is going to be the hepatitis B vaccine at birth. Uh, and then the hepatitis B second dose with rotavirus, tetanus, diphtheria, the acellular pertussis, H influenza type B, pneumococcal and inactivated polio vaccines are given at two months of their chronological age. Now this is a big important uh, clue, it's chronological age. That's a, they like to ask that question a lot. Um, so just remember that cr chronologically, meaning um, that you know, chronologically, they, they, they were delivered and now chronologically their age is whatever. Uh, so according to that, that's when these are given. So remember, hepatitis B, first dose at birth, and all the other ones, that huge regimen is at two months. The only exception to scheduling vaccines by age is the hepatitis B vaccine, which should be administered when the patient weighs at least four pounds, six ounces, more or less. Uh, live attenuated vaccines are safe for immunocompetent infants, regardless of their gestational age. And the first dose of measles, mumps, rubella, and varicella vaccines is typically administered around the time where they're one years of age. Currently, all states are going to allow medical exemption from vaccination, like if they have allergies to vaccine components. And some states even uh, allow for exemption based on a parent's religious or personal beliefs which uh, is a controversial topic right there. I mean, I personally have my own opinions about it, but let's just keep that to another discussion. But right now, um, that's the uh, law, is that some states do allow for exemptions based on the parent's religious and or personal beliefs. If a child is unvaccinated and is not exempt, then he or she may not be able to be enrolled in daycare or a school, so that's, that's a, uh, that may be a problem, depending on the state. And the physician must respect the mother's decision, but is not obligated to inform her about the health associated risks and benefits, as well as the potential consequences. I'm sorry, is, is obligated, and I don't know why I said is not. The, the, I mean, the physician has to inform her about the health associated risks and benefits as well as the potential consequences, like uh, they're not gonna be able to enroll in school. The discussion uh, should be fully documented, obviously in the medical record, you don't want to say no, she didn't accept it, and then later she'll sue you for not vaccinating her kid. That's very weird. Okay, next, recommended vaccines for adults. So let's go by age groups. So if 
the adult is between the ages of 19 to 64, not 1964, <laughs> 19 to 64 years old, then the Tdap or TD, the tetanus or Tdap, um, the Tdap is once is given once as a substitute for a TD booster, and then you just give the TD booster every 10 years, and that goes for actually from all all ages above 19, so 19 and up, so above age 65 as well, and that also goes for the influenza uh, vaccine, which is given every year from you're 19 until you die. That's influenza. Now, when it becomes different is the uh, pneumococcal vaccine. So there's, there's uh, two, remember there's gonna be two different types of pneumococcal vaccines that just always used to trip me up. There's the PPSV23 alone, and then there's the PCV13 with the PPSV23. So when do you give it alone, the PPSV23? That's uh, with chronic heart, uh, problems, lung or liver diseases, as well as diabetics or current smokers and alcoholics. That's when you just give it by itself. Um, the sequential PCV13 with the PPSV23 is for very high risk patients between the ages of 19 to 64. And that's if they have like CSF leakage, that's not good cochlear implants or sickle cell disease or they don't have a spleen, asplenic patients, immunocompromised patients that are HIV or they have some kind of malignancy and chronic kidney disease patients. You want to give them both the PCV13 with the PPSV23 if they're in the age groups of 19 to 64 years of age. Now, if they're over 65 years of age, you want to give them both the sequential PCV13 um, with the PPSV23 um, as follows. So first dose of PCV13 is given, and then that's followed by a, another dose of PPSV23, but six to 12 months later. So that's the important key right there. Okay, so adults should be given the Tdap as a one-time dose and it's also especially true for pregnant women and all adults who are in close contact with ch small children. The intramuscular inactivated influenza vaccine is given annually to all adults, healthy or non-pregnant adults, less than 50 years of age can receive the live attenuated intranasal influenza vaccine. However, its safety has not been established for patients with comorbidities. Uh, such as like diabetes, and they should not be given in patients who are taking care of severely immunocompromised patients. So in patients who are given PPSV23 by itself before they're 65 years old are given a sequential pneumococcal vaccine after 65, but then patients with a history, a prior history of a PPSV23 should then wait for at least one year before receiving the PCV13. Now, uh, people traveling to North Africa, um, if they're specifically saying that they're going to be traveling to North Africa, they should be vaccinated against hepatitis A virus, B virus, and typhoid, plus you have to give them a polio booster. And of the most vaccines that are preventable infectious diseases is going to be hepatitis A. So that's going to be the most important one that you always give. If you don't know what to give them and they're traveling, give them a hepatitis A. Uh, vaccine. People going to developing countries um, have higher risks of contracting it and chances increase with the duration of stay. So uh, the longer they're there, the more likely they're going to have contact with the hepatitis A virus. Mortality increases with age as with most viruses and it approaches 3% in adults that are greater than 55 years old. European and North American countries are considered low risk for hepatitis A. Most Asian and African countries, however, are extremely high risk zones. A single dose of hepatitis A vaccine is gonna be considered sufficient for young immunocompetent adults, and a second dose should be administered for long-term immunity. Um, also, yellow fever vaccination, that's gonna be recommended for people traveling to Sub-Saharan Africa and South American countries because of the jungly nature of the yellow fever.
All right, next up is going to be tetanus prophylaxis, which is another high yield topic. Um, and this has to do with what do you, how do you prophylax them with the tetanus? And it's depending on the severity of the wound, right? If it's clean, dirty, or whatever. So if it's clean or the wound is very small, like you cut yourself or whatever, um, more than three tetanus toxoid doses. If the, if um, you want to give a tetanus toxoid containing vaccine, only if the last dose was given more than 10 years ago. If they've never been, then you want to give them the um, the uh, tetanus immunoglobulin. Now, if they have a dirty or severe wound, uh, then tetanus toxoid containing vaccine is given, and only if the last booster is given more than five years ago. And um, but you, if not, then you give the tetanus immunoglobulin. All right, and then unimmuni unimmunized uh, or uncertain of their tetanus dose, so they don't know. Um, if it's a clean or minor wound, you want to give them the tetanus toxoid. If they have a dirty or severe wound, you want to give them the tetanus toxoid plus the TIG, the tetanus immunoglobulin. So tetanus containing vaccines are going to be recommended every 10 years. That's something you should commit to memory. Every 10 years you should get a tetanus vaccine. Tetanus toxoid can be given as either the uh, toxoid, which is abbreviated TT, or the diphtheria tetanus toxoids, um, which is absorbed, uh, that's DT, or the above two in the table that we saw. Now, dirty wounds are going to be like, uh, so what's the definition of a dirty wound? That's obviously a wound that's contaminated with dirt, feces, or saliva. And a severe wound would be like a puncture wound, an avulsion, uh, wounds due to a crush injury, burns, or frostbites. And that is a tetanus prophylaxis. Next up is a small little section on rotavirus. Um, remember, the rotavirus is going to be a live attenuated vaccine. And the vaccine series normally is administered between two to six months of age. So what are some of the contraindications to rotavirus? These are the ones that they like to ask. Um, if they've had a history of anaphylaxis to vaccine and the ingredients in the vaccine, then you want to um, not give that to them. If they have a history of intussusception, if they have a history of an uncorrected congenital malformation of the GI tract, like if they have a history of a Meckel's diverticulum, or if they have uh, SIDS, severe combined immune deficiencies. And it's also safer to administer with other inactivated vaccines. It's safe to administer with other inactivated vaccines because remember we said earlier um, some live vaccines shouldn't be given with inactivated vaccines because the inactivated vaccines are still going to somewhat alter your immune response and that leads to uh, a higher probability of getting sick from an, a live vaccine in the combination. But in this case, it's safe to administer the rotavirus live attenuated vaccine uh, with other inactivated vaccines at the same time. Next is going to be meningococcal vaccines. Um, this one's important. The meningococcal vaccination, the, the, there's prima the primary vaccination is going to be given at ages 11 to 12 um, or at 13 to 18 if they've never been vaccinated. Then um, it's optional between the ages of 19 to 21 if they haven't been vaccinated. Um, it's also optional for high-risk patients and first-year college students in residential housing. Uh, booster vaccination, uh, you want to give the booster at ages 16 to 21 if they have had a primary vaccination before they turn 16. And if, it's older than, if they're older than 21, you want to consider if they're high-risk patients or not. High-risk patients are going to be patients that have like complement deficiency, if they have functional or ana anatomical asplenia, uh, if they have HIV or exposure to a community outbreak, if they uh, travel to a hyperendemic country, or if they're military recruits. Those are all uh, definitions of high-risk patients. Now, the meningococcal vaccine is also recommended for those that are going to be traveling to highly endemic environments. 
like sub-Saharan Africa and Muslim privilege, uh, pilgrimages to Mecca or Saudi Arabia. You should uh, get a meningococcal vaccination. Vaccination in asplenic patients, strep pneumonia is going to be the most common cause of infection in post splenectomy patients. The patients are given the PCV13 followed by the PPSV23 at 8 weeks, like we said earlier. All patients should receive the vaccination either more than 14 days before planned splenectomy or more than 14 days after a splenectomy. Um, and although antibody titers are comparable, if given within 14 days and after 14 days, their functional activity is actually going to be lower in patients who are given in less than 14 days of post splenectomy. So what are the, some of the recommendation, recommended vaccines for patients, adult patients that have no spleen? So asplenic patients, recommendation for vaccinations. So pneumococcal vaccinations are, you want to give a sequential PCV13 and PPSV23 and as well as a re-vaccination with the PPSV23 five years after um, they turn 65. For H influenza, um, you want to give them a one-dose uh, Hib vaccine, so the H influenza B vaccine. For meningococcal, um, for asplenic patients, you want to give the meningococcal quadrivalent vaccine, and then you want to re-vaccinate them every five years. For influenza, you can give them the inactivated influenza vaccine annually, that just doesn't change. And other vaccines um, that can be given to asplenic patients are going to be hepatitis A, B virus, and the Tdap once a substitute for the tetanus vaccine is given, and then the TD every 10 years. Okay, so next is going to be what are the recommenda recommended vaccines for chronic liver disease? So Tdap and TD, um, the Tdap is given once as a substitute for a TD booster, and then you just give the TD booster every 10 years. For influenza, that doesn't change again. That's given every year annually. For pneumococcal vaccines, you want to give them the PPSV23 one time, and then you want to revaccinate them with a sequential PCV13 and the PPSV23 once they reach 65 years old. The hepatitis A viral uh, vaccine, you want to give them two doses that are six months apart with the initial negative serologies. Um, and then, so they have to be negative, obviously. And then hepatitis B is a three dose uh, regimen at zero, do at zero months. And then after one month, you give them again. And then at least after four months with initial negative serologies. And then next up, the recommended vaccinations for adults with HIV. Um, so we have the hepatitis A virus. Uh, vaccination vaccine that's indicated if they have chronic liver disease that includes both hepatitis B virus and C virus men who have sex with men and IV drug users all those people are going to have the hepatitis A vaccination um, if for all patients without documented immunity to hepatitis B virus you want to give them the hepatitis B viral vaccination um, HPV vaccine is given in both men and women between the ages of 9 to 26 years old. So 26 years of age is the cutoff. And influenza, you want to give them annually for all patients. That just doesn't change. The meningococcal vaccination is given to all patients between the ages of 11 to 18. Large groups living in close proximity like college students or military recruits. Incarcerated patients are given the meningococcal vaccination as well as asplenic patients or complement deficiency patients. Uh, the pneumococcal vaccine is, remember the PCV13 is given once and then PPSV23 eight weeks later. Then you give them the, um, then they give them the PPSV23 every five years. So PCV13 once followed by PPSV23 eight weeks later, and then PPSV23 every five years. It's kind of like the thing you have to commit to memory. Uh, tetanus, diphtheria, and pertussis, the Tdap you give once. Then you want to repeat that Tdap for women during each pregnancy, and the tetanus booster every 10 years following a Tdap. Um, 
remember which were the live vaccines. They were the MMR, varicella, the zosters, the live attenuated influenza. And those vaccines that are live are, guess what, contraindicated in HIV with a CD4 count that's less than 200. All right, so most live vaccines like the BCG vaccine, the anthrax vaccine, oral polio, oral typhoid, yellow fever, these are all contraindicated in, in HIV. The only exceptions of live vaccines that can be given are going to be the MMR, the varicella, and the live attenuated influenza in the absence of evidence of immunity before, like if they were born before 1957, that's documented evidence of prior vaccination, or positive lab titers. If their CD4 count is more than 200, and there is no history of AIDS-defining illness like um, PCP, uh, Mycobacterium avium, CMV, esophagitis. So um, if their CD4 count is more than 200, then you can give them those live vaccines. Remember, it's only contraindicated if the, vac if the uh, CD4 count is less than 200. Patients who actually acquire HIV peri perinatally and receive the MMR before the initiation of antiretroviral therapy should re receive a repeat MMR vaccination after the initial initiation of the uh, antiretroviral therapy. So, however, if a person is not taking antiretroviral therapy and has a CD4 count that's more than 200, then uh, an MMR is not going to be contraindicated. Remember that 200. If it's greater than 200, then you can give them the live vaccines like the MMR, varicella, zoster, live attenuated influenza. But if it's less, don't. All right, next is going to be occupational post-exposure prophylaxis in HIV patients. So there's going to be, um, this is going to be divided into high risk uh, occupational exposure, uh, low risk timing and regimen. So if they're high risk contact patients with then prophylaxis is recommended. So exposure meaning um, exposure of mucous membranes, non-intact skin, or a percutaneous exposure. And if they have exposure to blood, semen, vaginal secretions, or any body fluid with visible blood, um, or if they have uncertain risk like CSF fluid, pleural pericardial fluid, or synovial fluid, or peritoneal fluid, or amniotic fluid, these are high risk contacts so you want to prophylax them um, for uh, HIV post-exposure prophylaxis. Now if they're exposed to urine, to feces, nasal secretions, saliva, sweat, and tears but no visible blood these are low-risk contacts and prophylaxis is not recommended. Um, now for timing how do you how do you do this? So initiate urgently it's preferably in the first few hours and you want to continue that for up to 28 days. And the regimen is going to be a three drug regimen at minimum. Uh, and then it includes two NNRTIs, the nucleotide uh, reverse transcriptase inhibitors like tenofovir uh, and emtricitabine with an integrase strand transfer inhibitor like raltegravir a protease inhibitor or a non-nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So one, I'm, I'm sorry, two NRTIs plus either an integrase inhibitor, protease inhibitor, or an NNRTI. And the risk of seroconversion is going to be low following a ne needle stick exposure. So that's less than 5% is actually seen primarily uh, with hollow bore needles like phlebotomy as opposed to a solid needle exposure like a suture so um so yeah um if hiv status of source of the source patient is unknown but it has a risk factor for hiv then the prophylactic therapy should be started while you wait for the hiv testing results Exposed healthcare workers should be immediately tested for HIV to, to establish baseline serological status testing. And uh, this, that testing should be repeated every six weeks, uh, three months, and then finally six months. In addition to baseline serological testing, post-exposure prophylaxis should be started immediately, and that's preferably with 
few hours of exposure within few hours of exposure and if possible workers should be relieved of duties immediately to initiate post-exposure prophylaxis now tenofovir emtericidabine and raltegravir these is the preferred therapy because uh, they have less side effects and low drug to drug interactions and that's going to be it for hiv so now it's going to be acute bacterial parotitis and post that's post operatively so acute bacterial parotitis post operatively patients are going to be most prone to developing this infection uh, clinical signs and features include fever, uh, leukocytosis, and parotid inflammation, as well as painful swelling of the involved parotid gland that's going to be aggravated by chewing. Uh, on physical exam, you're going to see uh, tender, uh, tender, swollen, and erythematous glands with purulent saliva that's expressed from the parotid duct. The most common causes are going to be like staph aureus, and the prevention is going to be with adequate fluid hydration as well as oral hygiene, which is both pre and post operatively done. So um, timeline of causes of post-operative fever. So this is something that's uh, kind of really tested on this. So between zero to two hours, um, post-operative fever is gonna be due to a prior trauma or infection because of blood products or malignant hyperthermia. Um, remember that it's inflammation due to the surgery itself or the medication given during surgery like an anesthesia. That's the immediate response, zero to two hours. Then between two hours to 24 hours, not much, but 24 hours to a week later is because of nosocomial infections as well as um, uh, group A strep or gas or uh, Clostridium perfringes. Non-infectious causes would be <coughs> like a myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism, and uh, DVT can also be seen within that first week. And that's acute uh, post-op fevers. Subacute are gonna be um, fevers that start between a week to less than, to, to more than, a, uh, to, to a month sorry, from a week to a month. And that's uh, due to either um, uh, uh, other kind of organisms that's not strep or uh, group A strep or Clostridium perfringes. So any other uh, infections besides those two. Um, Clostridium difficile as well and drug fever. Uh, they can also get a PE and a DVT. So the DVT and a PE is um, basically can happen between one day to a month as well as surgical site infections occur within a week to a month and then finally delayed post-operative fever this is when you're getting fever after a month since uh, your hospitalization or since your operation and that's usually due to viral infections or some kind of indolent organism okay and the causes of post-op fever, I think we all remember the five W's, wind, wound, water, walk, and wound. Wind is for the lungs, that's when you get pulmonary embolisms, pneumonia, and aspiration. Wound is for surgical site infection. Water is because of UTIs. Walk is your DVT. And wonder for wonder drugs or products, and this is drug-related fevers, blood products, and IV lines. Well, drug fever is a diagnosis of exclusion that typically occurs one to two weeks after the medication is given. It's often accompanied by like a rash and a peripheral eosinophilia, and it's often associated with the use of anticonvulsants, antibiotics like beta-lactam antibiotics and sulfonamides, as well as allopurinol. Um, coagulase negative staph, uh, like staph epidermidis, is part of the normal flora, but remember it common causes of the bloodstream infections is seen in patients with intravascular catheters because they just presented they pushed the the um, normal flora into the uh, vasculature and factors that favor infection over contamination are going to include systemic signs such as fever hypotension or a leukocytosis also erythema and tenderness at the catheter site can be seen as well as 
absence of local signs, which does not rule out an infection. Just So just because you don't have any kind of local signs doesn't mean that you're free of infection. Culture growth is usually done within 48 hours, and it's both in aerobic and anaerobic bottles. Two or more blood uh, blood culture samples with the same organism and drug susceptibility, as well as indwelling urinary catheters. These are going to increase the risk for UTIs with enteric organisms like E. coli, Klebsiella, pneumonia, and Proteus. I always have this little thing that I say for um, UTI infections, EPK. I don't know if that, that'll help, but whatever. It's E. coli, Klebsiella, uh, or Proteus, or whatever. Um, pointers azithromycin so these are just pointers uh, generalized pointers for this um, is that azithromycin is going to be safe for use in pregnancy erythromycin estolate is uh, contraindicated however because it can cause acute cholestatic hepatitis so erythromycin contraindicated but azithromycin is safe in pregnancies um, severe coughing paroxysms cause an increase in intraalveolar pressure and if you have an increase in uh, intraalveolar pressure this causes air to leak from the chest wall into the subcutaneous tissue causing a subcutaneous emphysema and uh, by similar procedure pneumothorax can occur hence patients with subcutaneous emphysema due to um, coughing paroxysms should have chest x-rays done immediately to rule out a pneumothorax. So that's going to be the end for virology and now we're going to be starting on bacteriology.